coaches, thanks for joining us for another Modern Soccer Coach interview. This time we're joined by Adam Thornton, author of the brand new book, Gerrard's Blueprint, an inside look, an in-depth look at Steven Gerrard's tactical evolution, his tactical work with his team at Rangers. Highly, highly recommend you check out the book. The link is below. I wanted to get him on and talk about three specific things that I really enjoyed in the book. The first is the pressing piece. The second is positional rotation. The third is the midfield balance. That is really, really, really interesting. So check it out on this interview. If you want to listen to the full interview, it's available on the podcast. The link there is below. Please get on there and subscribe. You can listen to the full thing there. Before we start, massive thanks to Keyframe who have teamed up with us for these interviews keyframe telestration tool easy to use affordable and it can take your coaching to a new level thanks very much to keyframe let's talk stevie gerrard's tactics here's adam the first question that i wanted to ask you here uh, you wrote that rangers deliberately instructed their three forward to stay high and only track back when out of possession with a deliberate intent of ensuring they are in a position to attack quickly should the ball be won so was that was almost the counter attack strategy then? Those those front yeah. three got a little bit more leeway defensively with the duties when the ball was a bit a bit deeper. Yeah, and, and it did vary. Like I said, Ryan Kent would would press back maybe in in bigger games or in certain situations. Absolutely, but on the whole, I think the the tactical change that was made at the start of the first season was to bring bring the wingers in and make them twin tens. And by doing that, we wanted to get more control and. A final third of the and have them more settle, have them supporting Alfredo Morelos more because he was becoming quite isolated. So there was sort of two sides to that, but but certainly from then the wingers were less had less of a direct relationship with the fullbacks, and it was maybe more of a turned it into that triangle, if you like, where they were the the tip of the triangle, not necessarily pressing frantically, but as soon as the ball came past them, the the outside midfielders would be pressing and then if we won the ball back obviously the front three are in a pretty good position to to take advantage of it when when Klopp leaves Liverpool uh, I know he's not under any pressure at the minute and, and obviously like Gerard is probably going to be a name that comes up um, and Klopp's characteristics of this high press and style I mean where do you think he stands on that Klopp being here as a high pressing coach? Where where is Gerard? Um, I, I would say he's maybe on that scale. If Klopp's a ten, I would say he's maybe a, a seven. Uh, I think it's not. It's absolutely not all out pressing. There was arguments that we could have done it a lot more and, and suffocated teams a lot more. We always had that sort of inbuilt um, cautious optimism, if you like, where we would be solid first. We'd be obsessed with in that first season we probably pressed a lot and it was probably not as structured as it could be which meant we were still getting caught in in transition there's there's several games big european games where we've lost uh goals in, in the last minutes by having a sort of ragged out of possession structure because we're still trying to chase chase the win so i think probably similar to klopp over the years he's maybe ref, he maybe refined it a little bit and made it a little bit more um flexible if you like, but I would still say it's nowhere near what we see um, half the teams in, in the Premier League doing for the I think that probably, probably plays out with, with Villa. I'm sure many would say they're a high pressing team just now. They're, for me, they're a kind of team that are trying to play possession football, but they maybe don't quite have the amount of players or certainly the amount of quality players to be, to be able to do it. So I would say it probably roughly aligns to where they are just now. I would say six or a seven if, if Klopp's a ten, yeah. Okay, then moving it into positional rotations. Um, I'm going to put out a, a quote here from Michael Beale on the coach's voice that's in the book. The formation you choose is not all that important. Whatever on paper formation the players can form, different shapes in game, and the freedom to rotate is key, making this happen. The ability to be flexible and unpredictable is key in the modern game. It sounds great, uh, you know. As a coach, it sounds brilliant to have this philosophy of freedom. And uh, how did Gerard balance structure again, almost in a spectrum? Where was structure and where was freedom, and, and how did he balance that? Um, I think this is a this is an interesting one. Um, 
in year one, I would say there was there was very limited rotation, uh, position rotation. I would say it was a pretty bog standard four three three. You had a a midfield destroyer, maybe two two box to box um, ball carriers, and then you'd have two wings, I guess, uh, Ryan Kent and Daniel Candias, two sort of old fashioned wingers, and then Morelos up front uh, as the focal point. And that maybe played out just in a sort of standard way, as you would expect, the, the sort of width coming from the fullbacks and the wingers, the midfield being functional, but able to try and get forward and harry, but the, their job was to basically destroy and, and give the ball to other players. Um, but then it sort of changed the introduction uh, towards the end of the season of, of Stephen Davis and Glamara, who are much more um, ball-playing midfielders, uh, shall we say, so they're more likely to come in and control the tempo. Uh, and maybe over that more solid base to allow more flexibility to happen further up the park. Um, and then when we get into the second season, we start to see players like um, Oribo, who's obviously now at Southampton and is very, very flexible. I think they call him a hybrid footballer in, in, the, in the book. He's another one who, from the top of my head, played left back every midfield position and every forward position for Rangers. So, so seven positions out of, out of the 10, basically he, he played um, during these three years at the club. So that, I guess, literally he was rotating positionally because sometimes he'd be playing a completely different position game to game. But in terms of what we're talking about here, he was crucial for it because him playing as a right winger didn't give what maybe Daniel Candias did as a sort of old fashioned winger. So he, he had a lot more flexibility, he would roam from his position. So sometimes it happened naturally. Um, other games, one that springs to mind that I have in the book was a, a 5-0 win against uh, Aberdeen in September 2019 where we played uh, Greg Stewart um, and Scott Arfield as Stewart sort of played as the right-sided number 10 and Arfield played as the right-sided number 8. Now, both of them are, are very similar players. They're, they're not pacey. They're not necessarily fantastic on the ball, but their, their movement off the ball and their ability to run in behind uh, and get on the end of things was, was key. Both of them basically switched at will during this game. Um, Aberdeen employed a, a pretty rigid man-marking um, system at this time against Rangers, and with both of them sort of moving horizontally and vertically, their marker was following them ridic to, to ridiculous points, was following them all over the park, and it just left so much space in there. So I think that game probably sums it up. For me, it probably didn't happen off uh, the position rotation piece, and certainly as we move past 55 and into um, ultimately the, the, the last few months of, of Gerard's reign, I think it was something that we probably could have done uh, a little bit more. Um, but the rotation aspect was was absolutely there. And I think that's probably talks to that point that Michael Beale mentioned. If you speak to most Rangers fans and probably most Villa fans, they would say that, that Gerard's style is very rigid and never changes. Um, it's pretty much a 4-3-3 or a 4-3-2-1 and, and that's it. Um I think that's probably true as a base shape, but as we talk about in the book, different players, for me, can do different things. For example, you've got Alfredo Morelos up front in the games that Jermaine Defoe plays. He doesn't play it in the same way that he plays. If, if Daniel Candace as a winger is playing versus Kamar Roof as a sort of inside forward, they're not playing in the same way. So naturally, the shape's going to change from half to half, game to game, minute to minute, probably. So the, the flexibility that they brought into the team was was more about the players rather than impacting the structure and just completely throwing the plan out and going I don't know three four three or something that was that was never going to happen but the, there was a bit more flexibility than I think people um, really gave them credit for. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, you mentioned in the book about Rangers playing deliberately with a slower tempo in some games in the build. Why did they do that? I think that was also a, a drawn out aspect as well. Um, there were certain games, um, a couple that spring to mind um, in in the 55 season where we played uh, Motherwell uh, away from home and then also Celtic at, at Parkhead. Um, we won both games. Motherwell, I think, was 5-1 was or 5-0. Celtic was one of the most complete Rangers performances I've seen. We beat them 2-0 um, and it probably could have been about 10 now. And the reasons for that were... Both teams played a, a back three or a back five uh, in Motherwell's case. Um, and the, the game plan in those games was was to give the ball to our fullbacks, who we deliberately kept um, deeper than they would normally be. Obviously, they were ultra-attacking. That was where all our wins came from. But in those games, we kept our fullbacks deeper. 
we played at a slower tempo, we would build up a lot slower. And what that meant is that Mullerwell and Celtic's fullbacks then had to come up the pitch 10 or 15 yards. Um, and then as soon as that happened, we would up the tempo uh, and play. There's a really good example um, of a goal that, that Jordan Jones scored uh, against Mullerwell. Uh, and you see that where we've dragged out their left back. There's a little quick interplay, I think, with, with Tavernier and, and Scott Arfield. Um, Jones makes the run and there's a pretty rudimentary ball in the channel behind the left back for Jones to run onto and, and score. So it was a little bit of a um, rope-a-dope type thing, I think, if you want to call it that, in terms of uh, drawing a team out um, by playing slower. Uh, and then as soon as you see, as soon as you see the opening, uh, they speed it up a little bit. Very interesting. Um, and then another piece in the book, uh, you've written a, um, a couple of pages on occupying width searching for depth and those two very like in coaching circles that's that's something that people are are talking about at the minute um i know uh, jonas monkvold uh is a who's a norwegian coach uh, done a really really good piece on it with a 442 book what i want to ask you is it why is it occupying with why are you searching for the depth why isn't it occupying depth or searching for width? why did why is the choice of language it's all from Michael Beale, to be honest. It's, it's pretty much his his words, and I think it it didn't make sense to me until until I I, I watched the video or or whatever it was I was I was doing, and he said basically the width the pitch doesn't really change. Um, you can't there's not a drastic amount of of width. Teams will play in the same sort of way. Wide, you're going to have three or four players, um, in defence maybe five depending on your system but it's not going to change too much there but obviously there is more depth than there is width um on a on a football pe- on a football pitch so occupying width in terms of making sure that you're covered and, and you're stretching a team as much as you can is absolutely key but it's then that vertical stretching that you want to try and get where there is so much more space a team could play a low block a mid block a high block they could be low mid high press um and, and just sort of figuring that out. Um, there's more variables, I think, in that. So it was making sure that you were covered, primarily for counter-attacks, uh, pressing, etc., making sure you were covered and you had enough players in each centrum, if you like, uh, on the width side. But for the attack, um, you wanted to make sure that you were focused on trying to get in and take advantage of, of whatever gaps the opposition left in a kind of vertical way. So that that was my take on, on what he meant for that. And, and when I read it, I thought that, made a lot of sense given the actual physical dimensions of a pitch that we're that we're talking about hello coaches we'll take a quick break here just to say a big thank you to our sponsors keyframe please go check them out video is a great great tool for coaching a lot of the work we do here involves video but the telestrations and the ability to animate can take your coaching to the next level and that's where keyframe come in they improve understanding aid retention and also save you time when you're delivering the work. Simple to use, easy to learn, works with any provider, and most of all, is affordable. I've used Keyframe, I use Keyframe. Please check them out. Here is a quick look at what they do. All right, and then the third piece that jumped out to me, I love this. This this uh, this was really, really interesting. Now you, the, the flat midfield three, so I know you talk about this a lot uh, in the detail. So, uh, like, can you just give us, uh, I suppose, a little little snippet of, of, of what this is? So this is interesting because this performed very well for us. I mentioned Stephen Davis and Glenn Kamara coming in in, in January 2019. Um, and obviously the, the game that you're talking about here is, is the one each game um, uh, away to Porto in October 2019. Um, this did work very, very well in certain circumstances, and I think 
mentioned before, the challenges that Rangers faced can be very, very different from playing away against Porto to at home against Motherwell, St Mirren, Hamilton. Um, so we have to almost have two different philosophies. Um, games where we don't have the ball are sort of few and far between. And that's where I think this this sort of flat midfield three came into, came into being. Um, the three of them are very, very similar players. Um, you could argue that they're all number sixes, probably. Um, so it's, it's a very, very interesting thing. And I think it is something that Gerard possibly tried to do at Villa for for a bit, is, is give that sort of defensive structure. Um, I mentioned how Glenn Kamara and Ryan Jack would all would would first of all their primarily primarily would be lateral cover for the fullbacks to make sure that they weren't getting caught in transition. They could come out the way, cover in that way, offer angles for Philip Hellander, uh, Connor Goldson to come out with the ball. So they would cover laterally as well. And because it was three of them, obviously they didn't have too far to go, so they could still maintain their shape in there. You had Stephen Davis as generally the central six who'd be in charge of build-up play and ball progression from from deep. So all three of them were capable um, and they all sort of interchanged. But as you can see from this, this is the average positions from the from that game. So they literally all played in a line and they offered that that barrier to protect the centre-backs. As you can see, the full-backs are, are very fi- far forward when you consider we're playing against Porto. I think we had, I don't know, 35% possession, probably less than that, to be honest. So um, they offered that barrier first and foremost, which was great, and it served us very, very well in, say, from January 2019 through until March 2020 when, when COVID hit. That was very, very good. On the flip side of it, and I think I mentioned in, in more detail in this in this chapter, um, in games where you're trying to break down a low block, uh, I think there's a St Mirren example uh, in the book, three essentially defensive midfielders when you're trying to break down a low block isn't, uh, there you go, you've read my mind, um, having three central midfielders when you're trying to break down a low block isn't exactly what you want and I think it's a, a similar issue that, that Jer- uh, Klopp maybe had uh, in the early years where he was focused on that sort of functional three Midfield um, relied on the fullbacks to get forward, but he maybe wasn't able to create from deep until maybe a Tiago comes into the team. So um, it'd be great if Rangers could get a Tiago, but that was pretty unlikely a, a couple of years ago. So it, it had its moments, it had its positives, and it had its negatives. It was great for big games, uh, and it really kept us in games a lot. They did a fantastic job, the three of them. But interestingly, when we then changed in the fifty-five season to one number six and two free eights or two attacking eights. Um, that, to me, was the most important evolution of the team um, and I, I would say was was probably one of the most important parts of, of actually taking the handbrake off and, and going and breaking down these low blocks and ultimately winning the title. So that was a, it was a bit of an interesting one to go through because you would sort of ultimately, or I would maybe paint that as, as negative, that, that midfield three, but then when you actually delve into the detail of it and you think about the platform they gave the team, the structure that they were able to to implement there, and then obviously evolving it further to go and do something else is great. But I think we still need to appreciate just how how solid that that three was and what they gave to the team. Yeah, it almost that mad structure. Um, I'm fascinated by like structured under the ball, and obviously like in recent years we we get this in coaching circles. This you know how to how to prevent counter-attacks with structure and Guardiola and the work he's done with that there. But when we talk about structure and freedom, this creates a lot of freedom in those higher spaces to move and and, and almost take risks. You're right. I think you can see there as well, we had John Flanagan playing in this game where James Lavernier wasn't available, so he was able to help in the structure defensively because he's not not great on the ball um, and not, uh, not necessarily an attacking fullback. So in this game... We're effectively playing with six players whose whose key or who, whose primary ambition is to uh, defend or, or do work behind the ball, if you like. And it only left us with four uh, ahead of the ball, which, with all due respect, at home to St Mirren, you're probably looking to, for Rangers to have two or three behind the ball rather than, than six. So the structure here is great and looks really, really sound, I think, in terms of the context of a, of a, a sort of philosophy or a coaching game but when you add in the, the the sort of context of the actual game and what we're trying to do it maybe wasn't as effective 